Welcome to the second lecture uh, of uh, Franz de Waal. Um, I recognize several of you, so I don't think I have to review last, uh, the last lecture yesterday um, on empathy and cooperation in animals. The theme of today is morality, and one title was Reuniting Biology and Morality, and here is an alternative title. Um, this has been a work that Franz de Waal has been involved in for a long time. Um, I looked in my bookshelf, and this is the very first book I ever bought on animal cognition. It was in 97, um, as a high school student. And I had no interest whatsoever in morality when I bought it. Um, the reason was that it was so difficult to find books on uh, animal cognition of any kind in Swedish bookstores. And there was no online shopping then, of course. Um, and even more interesting, I found a newspaper clip from March 97 of a review of the book that I was not that interested in. Um, it's a very good review, um, and it supports all of Franz de Waal's claims in the book. Um, so apparently this was a very happy reviewer, or, um, yeah, the, the question is what has happened in these 20 years since the publishing of this book, and why is it still a need to reunite biology and um, morality? So please, Franz de Waal. Thank you. Is this, is this working? Yeah. Yeah, I like reviews that agree with me. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, and, I, and I remain interested in this topic. And the, the last book I wrote on this is called The Bonobo and the Atheist. And that's why I'm mentioning religion here. Because religion is... That's the funny thing. Is that I'm not particularly interested in religion. And I'm not particularly religious. I, I always call my t myself an apatist. You know, you have the agnostic who doesn't know if God exists. You have the atheist who knows that God doesn't exist. And then I'm an apatist, I don't care. I just don't think it's an interesting problem and I'm not gonna solve it for you. So, um, but religion is, plays um, a big role in what people think about um, morality. And so I, I was gonna give a little bit more of a philosophical talk. I think that this is a philosophy department. And so I was going to talk a little bit more about uh, the philosophical, philosophical side. We have this view of nature, uh, of homo homini lupus, which is very unfair to the wolf, actually, because the wolf is a highly cooperative animal. But we have this Hobbesian view of nature. Nature is a place of the right of the strongest, and a dog-eat-dog -dog world where everyone beats up everyone. And um, the idea of morality is, uh, and nature is sort of opposite. And then in addition to that problem comes religion, where people think religion is what gave us morality. So this is a quote from Ben Carson, a, a guy in the Trump administration at the moment. Uh, uh, good material for many comedians in the US, Ben Carson. Um, and here, this is what he says about morality and evolution. If you accept evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics, you don't have to abide by a set of moral codes, you determine your own conscience based on your own desires. So basically, if you accept evolutionary theory, there's no room for morality, and, and you will just follow your own desires, and by the way, your own desires are bad. They're never good, you have bad, a lot of bad desires. That's the view on... Um, religion and morality. So p many people believe that without religion and without God, there would be no morality. And some people, even, even Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, a very respected geneticist, he has said that the fact that morality exists proves that God exists. So this is a scientist. So basically the thinking is that religion equals morality, that evolution is antithetical to religion. You cannot be religious and believe in evolution, so to speak. 
And as a result, evolution and morality don't go together. That's what Ben Carson is saying. So that's what I'm up against. I, I don't think here in Sweden I need to make that point. Uh, and also when I'm in Holland, I need to make that point that, that you can be perfectly moral without religion. But in the US, um, that's not uh, a self-evident position. Now, within biology, for 150 years, we've had this debate going on as well. So, so not even including religion so much, but the debate of where morality comes from and where it fits in. And so natural selection, which is sort of the basic mechanism of evolution, is not a nice process. Natural selection is a process of elimination. It's not a struggle for life principle. Many people believe that, but... It's not necessarily the strongest who wins. If, if I'm the weakest member of a group, but my immune system is better than that of everybody else, I'm going to win. So immune system, your hearing, your sight, your senses, your escape tactics, all of these things matter. And strength in the struggle for life is only one of the issues. So th this picture is actually completely wrong. That's not really what natural selection is about. It's not necessarily like this. But people have this image of struggle for life, and, and it was very popular, and it remains very popular. It's not a term that comes from Darwin, but he adopted it at some point. And it has led to two views of morality. One is nature is nasty and aggressive and competitive, and so morality can only be a veneer. Morality cannot be deep down in us. And, and that's where, of course, religion and culture and education and everything comes in. It's not part of human nature. That's one view. And then the second view is that we have a social nature, like many animals, like elephants and dolphins and wolves and so on, and that the moral tendencies are sort of outgrowth of that. They, they are part of that. They, they are continuous with our social nature. That's sort of the two views in biology that we've had for the longest time. Now, the veneer theory, as I call it, the idea that morality is not deep down in us, was defended by Huxley. Thomas Henry Huxley was um, the big defender of Darwin. He was known as Darwin's bulldog because he was much nastier <laughs> as a person than Darwin was. And he would very aggressively defend evolutionary theory, uh, but his views on morality deviated completely from Darwin. So Darwin and, and Huxley did not agree on this, and this is Huxley's view, is that morality is a departure from nature. It cannot be part of nature. It is uniquely human, cannot be found elsewhere, and it's calculated. That's an interesting word, is that uh, if I decide to be moral, it is out of a calculation that that's the best thing to do under the circumstances. That's very tricky, I think, if, if you're moral in that sense, but that's how he described it. And his big metaphor was the gardener in the garden. This is the garden from my father-in-law in France. And, and I know you need to work in this garden every day to keep it in order. And that was the metaphor that Huxley used. Huxley said, the garden wants to go wild, the garden wants to go in all directions, but the gardener works every day and sweats every day to keep it under control. And that's what morality does to human nature. Human nature wants to go in all sorts of directions, sometimes very wrong ones, but we have morality to keep it in check. So it's basically a fight. You're fighting against your own nature. That's what morality does. So it's still a very popular position. This is Richard Dawkins. Dawkins gives us a whole book, The Selfish Gene. The whole book is about how genes control us and we service the genes. We are here basically uh, to favor our genes uh, and we are completely the, the vehicles and the slaves of the genes. And then the last sentence of the book, he all of a sudden may regret what he had said. And he thinks, well, we can actually throw those genes out of the window. We don't need the genes. We alone on Earth, that's the uniqueness claim, can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. Because he, he doesn't know how to handle morality and altruism in, in his scheme of thinking. And so um, we need to do something. We can chuck our genes out of the window, and that's perfectly fine. And then, then we can be moral. So again, we need to go against our own nature and, and remove our own gene genetic heritage. 
This is the most quoted line of that literature, which is quoted all over the um, in the 70s and 80s. Scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. So this basically states that if you meet a kind person who is altruistic, don't trust that person. It's probably a hypocrite who tries to get something from you. Uh, so there are, there are no truly altruistic people. They don't exist, Not let alone don't talk about animals. But this is just about people we're talking. So that's a very pessimistic literature. And I had to live through that period as a biologist. Uh, I found it terrible. I've compared it in one of my books as living in a toilet as a frog. So, so there are frogs in Australia who live in a toilet. And they see all the stuff coming by every day, and that's what happened to me. <laughs> and uh, I, I couldn't stand it because I don't. Be my belief in human nature is not like that. It's not like that human nature is per definition bad, and that we have to work hard to be good. Because it's actually in Holland we call it the Calvinistic view. I'm from this, the Catholic South of the Netherlands, and Evo, who is here, will probably understand what I mean. But the, the Calvinists in the North. They have that view. We are born bad, and we have to work very hard to be good. And, and I was raised with the idea we're born pretty good. Yeah. And we don't need to work so hard. So this is a, a sketch from Monty Python that explains how these people were thinking at the time, in the 70s and 80s, which, by the way, is also the time of Reagan and Thatcher. I don't think that's accidental. Uh, these people also believed that everything was based on selfishness. So here we have a banker who uh, is asked for a pound for the orphanage. And, and you will see how he reacts. Oh, I need sound. Yeah. Let's go over again. Sound. So the banker says at some point, what is my incentive? And, and that whole literature at the time was about that, is that you need to get always something back for what you do, and if not, then, then you're probably a hypocrite. And so uh, it was a very pessimistic view, and it was not in line with what Darwin himself said. This is sort of my summary of, of veneer theory. This is human nature, and at the core, human nature is very bad, Around it, it's not good. And then we have morality around that. And so that was sort of the view, and it was completely accepted. In, in, uh, in the 70s and 80s, this was the view. And if you didn't believe this, you were a romantic. Uh, you were sort of delusional, uh, wishful thinking about human nature. So this was the thinking about that. Uh, I've always described it as the view of humans as psychopaths. Basically, a psychopath is a bit like this. A psychopath, for, for the psychopath, morality is like a veneer. That's, uh, that's, uh, he knows he needs to behave like that to get things done. And so basically, that whole literature described human psychopaths as the standard human. Now, Darwin had a very different view. Darwin, much wiser than his followers in, ge uh, followers in general, he said morality is a product of evolution. It is continuous with what we find in other animals, and that's what I will get to at some point. And it's based in the emotions. He was very much influenced by Adam Smith and David Hume. He had studied in Edinburgh and so on. And uh, he believed very much that uh, the emotions were at the basis 
of uh, morality. And this is a quote from, uh, if you read The Descent of Man, you will get a lot of inspiration about uh, where morality comes from. And here he says, any animal, whatever, endowed with well-marked social instincts would inevitably acquire a moral sense or conscience as soon as that animal has the mental powers that we do. And so he saw morality as continuous with animal sociality. And that's the position I take also, and, and that's what we will be talking about. And at the moment, we're really completely back to the Darwinian position. The Huxleyan position and the Dawkins position is completely gone, really. But people do experiments. I'm, I'm not going to talk much about human behavior, but one of the experiments that was done, I know very well, because it was done at Emory University, where they put people in a scanner, in a brain scanner, and they would ask them, to make choices, some of which were cooperative, where you could cooperate with somebody else, and some of which were selfish, where we, you, you would ignore the interests of the other, you would be completely selfish. And actually, people much more quickly make the cooperative choices, so they think much less about them, they do them quickly and voluntarily, and only if there are reasons not to be cooperative, like it's a stranger or uh, the, the person has been unfriendly to you and so on. If, if there are reasons not to be cooperative, you will choose the selfishness. And so we now have this whole literature which says that humans are by default actually cooperative and friendly and altruistic. And it takes some mental effort to be selfish. So these are what I see as the two pillars of morality. On the one hand, empathy and compassion. And my previous lecture was on empathy, so I'm going to say very little about this. The other one is reciprocity and fairness, where you do favors for each other, you have a cooperative system, and within that system, fairness becomes an issue. And that's the other pillar. And I see that as the two pillars of human morality. And without this, I don't think you can get human morality. If you there's a book at the moment by Paul Bloom which says Against Empathy, that's the title of the book. And he says that we could do away with empathy. Well, empathy is what makes you interested in others. If I'm not interested in others, if I don't care about others, why would I be a moral being? That's going to be very tough to imagine that. And so I think these two are absolutely essential. And without this, you don't get to human morality. So if we, if we look at the history of how people have explained human morality, of course, the, the original view was a bit like what I mentioned at the beginning, is that God gave us the moral rules, like the Ten Commandments. It's actually funny because the Ten Commandments, if you read the Ten Commandments carefully, the first five have nothing to do with morality. The first five is that you should be obedient to God and you should serve him on Sundays or whatever, or Saturdays or whatever the day is. So, so the first five have nothing to do with morality. And only with number six, thou shalt not kill, we get to morality. And even that one is imperfect because I think there are circumstances where you should kill. If, if tomorrow an army invades your country, you're going to kill and you will feel perfectly justified to kill. Then we got the philosophers. This is where the philosophy department uh, is based. Uh, reason and logic, the, basically the Kantian view. is that It's a top-down view that reason and logic are going to give us the moral standards and the moral rules and the distinction between right and wrong. I don't think they do. I think they're good at describing how we feel about right and wrong, um, but I don't think they do. And then more recently we have Sam Harris, the atheist, neo-atheist who has said science is going to give us morality. Science is, is ra uh, rash rationally based and science is going to tell us what is moral and what is immoral. I don't believe that at all. Science has given us, for example, eugenics. That's what science gives us. Science without some sort of emotional anchor in human nature is only going to cause trouble, I think. And now we have this whole field of moral psychology, um, and the sort of work that I do on the evolution of morality in animals and humans, uh, neuroscientists like Haidt and so on, who give us more like a bottom-up view of morality. Back to Hume basically say the mor morality is based in the emotions, the emotions are based in evolution, and, and that's how we get to morality. And there's, there's, before I get to the animal behavior, I want to say a few things about uh, naturalistic fallacy, because in, in philosophy that's always what they bring up, 
is that we cannot just describe animal behavior and human behavior and say that that has implications for morality. And you, they say you cannot move from is to ought, you cannot move from values to facts. And, and animal behavior is descriptive, whereas human behavior is prescriptive. And so this whole issue of normativity, which is so central to the discussion of morality and the, evolu the evolution of morality, uh, remains present in that kind of discussions. And I just want to pick one topic out of that, and that's the normativity of behavior. So, so who says that animals just do things and just are and have no norms? Who, who has ever said that? But that is often claimed in the literature, that only humans are normative. We have in the animal kingdoms an enormous set of norms. If I disturb an ant hill, the ants are going to work very hard to restore the hill. So they must have, I don't know how, don't ask me how, but they must have some sort of image of how the ant hill should look and how it should function. And if I disturb that, they're going to bring it back to the norm. You disturb a spider web, the same thing. The spider either abandons the web, if you do a very big job on it, or it starts repairing the web. So the, the spider has a norm of how a spider web should look. And, and this is all over the place. And, and now I'm just talking about physical structures, but I think the same thing exists in the social domain. And that's where, of course, morality then comes in. So, so let me as, uh, give as an example a dog. This is... Um, based on the work of Mark Beckhoff. I don't know if you know Mark Beckhoff, he's written extensively uh, about um, morality and the evolution of morality. And he studies canine behavior and he says that in the play behavior of dogs and wolves, you see a certain normativity. They play with each other as soon as one, they give a lot of clear signals how they should play and as soon as one bites or transgresses some of the rules of the game, they need to apologize, otherwise they cannot get back to play and they need to reconcile. And, and this is actually an interesting situation. This is the self-handicapping of big dogs and small dogs. If a big dog plays with a small dog, he needs to control himself very carefully, otherwise it, the things get out of control. You will see how this goes. So the interesting moment here was when the big dog went a little bit too far and he got a protest peep out of the little one. So the little one let him know that he was going too far. This was getting a bit, um, uh, a bit sort of uh, risky for the little one. And then they restored and then they started playing after that again. And I think this in animal behavior, if you look carefully, as, as Beckhoff did with the canines, if you look carefully, you see a lot of this rules that they have of the game and, and how they need to repair the situation if, if you uh, make a mistake in that kind of rule system. And so there is a certain normativity. The, the norm is, of course, relaxed play, and that's what you want to have, but it's not always possible if you're so diff different in size. It's not easy to achieve that. And that requires an enormous control, self-control for the big dog. Now, self-control by itself is a wonderful issue is very highly developed in animals. So, so we, we often think that animals don't control themselves, but you, you take a big male gorilla who with his thumb can kill a juvenile gorilla if he wants to. Very easy for it. He's much stronger than anything else. And he still plays with these little babies, and how does he do that? A bit like with this big, big dog. There's an enormous amount of self-control built into animals. Also emotional control. And so I think there is this normativity. So let me give you three examples, and in the rest of my talk, I will illustrate some of this. First of all, you have a hierarchical structure in many animals. So in a monkey group or in a chimp group, you clearly have a hierarchy from top to bottom. If you disobey the hierarchy, let's say you are a brave middle-ranking monkey and you attack someone who's higher, 
you're going to be put in your place. You're going to get bitten by a lot of others, and you're going to be put in your place, and the hierarchy is then restored. So, so m most animals don't actually accept at all any deviations from that hierarchy. They're very strict about these things. So that's one. You can have close relationships. Many animals have friendships and close relationships, sometimes kinship relationships. If these are disturbed by conflict, which happens very often, it's not unusual for two sister monkeys to have a big fight between them. They need to restore the relationship, so they reconcile, and I'll get to that. And that restores the relationship. So again, you have a deviation from the norm. The norm is a perfectly relaxed grooming relationship. But now you have a fight, and you need to do something about that situation. Or you have a harmonious group life, and there's an unfair distribution of things, and you need to protest against the inequality. You need to let others know that you also deserve as much as somebody else, and then harmony is restored if the equality is restored. And so this is the fairness principle, and at the end of the talk I will say a few things about fairness in the primates. And so basically my conclusion is that Normativity is built into animal and human behavior. You find it all over the place, also in the social domain. So this whole claim that normativity is, is unique for humans, I don't buy into that. I think there's an enormous amount of normativity, not just in relation to anthills and, and spider webs, but also in the social domain there is normativity. And that's highly relevant. That means that there is good and bad. There are good outcomes and bad outcomes. Uh, and in that sense, uh, there is this distinction between right and wrong. Uh, I usually say it as that animals don't care about right and wrong, but they do care about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior. Now, to get to the issue of conflict resolution, because that's the first one I mentioned, is that uh, a close relationship is disturbed by conflict. My first work started with that, and so uh, when I was a student, this is long ago, I discovered that chimpanzees reconcile after fights. This is two male chimps who had a fight, and it ended up in a tree, and one of them holds out his hand like this to the partner, and about a second after I took this picture, they came together and they kissed and embraced each other, and that's the reconciliation. Reconciliation has now been found in many species, but at the time, um, there was really no room for reconciliation because at the time when I was a student, everything was about competition. Everything was about aggression and competition. It was good to win a fight, it was bad to lose a fight. The whole idea that you would reconcile after a fight, um, people didn't know what to do with that. So this is a definition of reconciliation. Friendly union between former opponents not long after a conflict. And if that's how you define it, you're going to see it all over the place. So I'll show you a sequence. This is a male chimp who attacks a female. Uh, the female comes back 10 minutes later to the male. She offers her hand for a hand kiss. That's where our hand kiss comes from. No, I don't think so. I, I think our hand kiss is a, probably an independent in, invention. But, but it is a way of testing the male. It's a, because if he's in a bad mood, he's going to bite. So, uh, and then they proceed to the mouse-to-mouse -mouse kiss. And so that's a typical reconciliation in chimpanzees. And initially, sort of interesting, when I first reported this, uh, people, apart from people not knowing what to do with it because it didn't fit any kind of thinking at the time, uh, they also would say things like, uh, yeah, maybe chimpanzees do that because chimpanzees do a lot of interesting things. But uh, my animals would never do that. That's not true at all. There's lots of animals who show reconciliation, but uh, it's, it's so human-like in the chimpanzee, with the kiss and the embrace and so on, uh, that it is easier to recognize. This is how stumptail monkeys do it. So I've already mentioned yesterday that the distinction between monkey and ape is very big for us in primatology, and you're all basically apes and monkeys have tails. The stumptail uh, reconciles with this ritual. It's called the hold bottom ritual. One of them presents, the other one holds the hips and looks at the behind. There is no eye contact. So eye contact is for monkeys not necessary. Uh, for humans, I think, and for apes, it's essential. So humans and apes are in, in so many ways similar. And, and apes cannot reconcile without eye contact, I believe, and humans cannot reconcile. Well, 
You can try to reconcile via email, of course, and texts. It's not usually so successful, I would say. Um, but if you, let's say, you have a fight with your boss and you go to apologize to his office, and uh, your boss uh, keeps staring at the ceiling or st keeps staring in his coffee, you will not feel reconciled. You need to see him face to face. But monkeys um, do a lot of reconciliation this particular way. So the way we measure this is with the PCMC procedure, which has now been applied to lots of species. You, take, um, you wait for a spontaneous fight. We usually don't induce them. There are some studies that experimentally did that, but you wait for a fight, and then you do a post-conflict observation of, let's say, 10 minutes. And you see how many of them make contact within 10 minutes. And as you see, it's about 50% or 60% of them. They make a friendly contact after the fight. Then you do a control observation on a different day when there has been no fight between them, and you see how often they normally contact each other, and that's much less, it's like 20%. So this, this difference between the two is called post-conflict attraction. And the post-conflict attraction is exactly the opposite of what I learned as a graduate student. What I learned as a graduate student is that aggression is a dispersive mechanism. Aggression drives individuals apart. And what we see is actually aggression brings individuals together. It's very counterintuitive, maybe. Maybe not for me, it's sort of interesting. I'm from a family of six boys. And so I, I always feel that that played a role in me. I'm never upset by aggression because I've seen so much in my life. And um, I'm never uh, surprised by reconciliations. So maybe I was predestined to discover this because I'm from a big family. So now the bonobo, they do everything with sex. And so they also reconcile with sex. And so the bonobos do this. And, and so now we have this evidence for all sorts of species. Uh, of reconciling. We did the studies on preschool children, same sort of graphs you get, same sort of behavior you get. If they're older, it becomes verbal, so the young ones, they reconcile with physical contact, the older ones, they, they say, you can play with my truck, and that's a reconciliation. So uh, we did that, uh, in this case, we did it at um, Emory University at this, at the, in the schoolyard, but this has been done all over the world. And uh, there's very interesting cultural differences that have been found. So, for example, Japanese children, they reconcile much more easily than American children. And the scientists who do this say that it is because Japanese teachers never interfere. You know, maybe, maybe if the kids kill each other, they will interfere, but they normally don't interfere. They leave the kids alone, whereas American teachers immediately step in and start to mess with the process and say, shake hands and apologize and... I don't think kids learn much from that. So uh, these things have been done on many different cultures, and, and basically the pattern is very similar. This is a human reconciliation. This is when Obama was still a, um, a senator, and he got into a big fight with McCain, who is a very important senator, and uh, Obama lost the fight. And then uh, the photographer photographed the handshake between them, which was the reconciliation. So he acted a bit like a primatologist and took pictures of it. And what I really like is the expression on Obama's face. So Obama has put air under his lips. And you can try to do that for yourself. It's called the bulging lips face. And um, it's a face that chimpanzee males show when they confront each other and they lose. Let's say one male walks up to the other with all his hair up, trying to intimidate the other, the other one does the same thing back, and you step back and you try to get out of this, meaning you regret the confrontation, you're losing the confrontation. So it's an expression of regret and loss. It's very common in humans. I have an enormous collection <laughs> of... Uh, you see, uh, Clinton had a lot to regret at this point. <laughs> this is Armstrong. It's a very typical, if you look for it, you will see it all the time, and it's a male expression. Females don't show it. So, so it's either that women never regret anything, <laughs> it's a possibility, or they just don't have the face. So it's a male expression, also in chimpanzees, it's a male expression, and um, I always wonder if you have female leaders, like let's say Germany has a female leader. I've never seen uh, good pictures of female leaders uh, having this face. Uh, they maybe they get less into trouble also, that's possible. 
Now, the whole idea behind conflict resolution and reconciliation, and that's why it's interesting. That's why nowadays we have reached the point that if we find a species, a social species, where reconciliation does not occur, we are very surprised. We say, well, how do they maintain their society if they have no way of making up after a fight? And so we have now sort of reached the opposite point. Uh, but if you look at how people used to look at animals, this was the typical way, zero sum. Uh, you have winners and you have losers, and it's better to be a winner and it's bad to be a loser. And, and this per worked perfectly fine for territorial fish or for territorial birds. It's like one fish chases another one out of its territory. Why would they reconcile? There's nothing to reconcile over with them. So this was a, this was a very good model for a lot of the species that early ethologists studied. But if you look at social animals, here you have lions hunting together and buffaloes. The lions help each other in the hunt. The buffaloes sometimes help each other and liberate each other or together attack a lion. And so the, the, these are cooperative animals and these are cooperative animals. Now imagine you're a lioness, you're hunting with five other lionesses and you do that every day and you have a big fight with your sister. You should be very careful. If you harm your sister, if your rib are completely open, all these injuries may get infected and, and your sister may die. You have lost one sister. That's a very dangerous thing to do. And so there are very big constraints on what you can do. And, and you certainly need mechanisms of reconciliation and self-control in order to maintain these cooperative relationships. And so that's uh, what we get when a non-zero go, go game is going on. You have winners and you have losers, but you have an overlapping area of interest in which both of you lose if you have a fight. And it's that area that makes, that is the value of the relationship, and that, that's why we have the valuable relationship hypothesis that we use in that literature, and that's why you have reconciliation going on. It's to protect that common value of the relationships. And now, we, there's a lot of experimental studies and observational studies on this, certainly in the primates, but also in many other species. We have reconciliations in dolphins and elephants and hyenas and wolves and I, I don't know. Certainly in, in, I think, like 35 primate species. And so it's a very common pattern in social animals. And that is because they all have valuable relationships. And that's why they need to reconcile after fights. Now you can look at human morality as a system of conflict resolution. Human morality is very occupied with comparing individual interests and thinking about the community value. So the, the community is actually placed usually above the individual and, and moral systems are very occupied by making uh, clear what we can do and what we cannot do within the social system, what is harmful to society as a whole and what is acceptable or unacceptable within that society. And so conflict resolution is very much at the heart of moral systems, because that's what they intend to do. They intend to resolve conflicts between individual interests. Now, community concern uh, is, is something that I'm really very fond of as an issue. And, and that is because many of these studies on conflict resolution, we can translate in individual terms. Like, I have a good relationship with you, we have a fight, we both then have an interest to repair the relationship, because we're otherwise going to lose something. So, so that's the valuable relationship hypothesis, and, and it works very well for individuals. But is there something at the community level going on in animals? And there are sort of two uh, pieces of evidence that we can use for that. One is mediation, and the other one is the control role of adult males. So mediation... And I must say, I don't know of mediation in species other than the chimpanzee and the bonobo. Uh, I've not seen it in monkeys. But in chimps, it's a very common thing. So you have here two males who have been in a fight, uh, and it was a big fight. Instead of dispersing, uh, they sit together, they sit opposite each other, but they're not ready to reconcile. They're, they're not looking at each other, not, not making eye contact with each other, but uh, and, and if one of them looks up, the other one lo will look away or pick up some grass and start inspecting the grass. And I always compare it with two angry men at the bar, basically. But they're often brought together by a female. Often an older female, and in the Arnhem colony, this is in Arnhem, 
There was the oldest, Mama, the, f the female who just recently died at the age of 60. She would go to one of them and start grooming one of these males and groom for a few minutes. And then she would get up and walk to the other one. And this male would then walk right behind her. So he didn't need to make eye contact. He would r walk right behind that female. I if he didn't follow, she would turn around and grab his arm and make him follow. So it was an intentional act. She would then groom the other guy, and he would groom her, and then at some point she would disappear, and the two males would be grooming each other. So that's the mediation. And if you think about this, that means that Mama, or one of these older females, would first of all understand that there was a conflict, would understand that these males have trouble reconciling, otherwise why would she get involved? It's a very risky, a very explosive situation. It's a very risky thing to do. So she would understand that something needed to be done. And what would be her motivation? Why, why get involved in this? Unless you have some sort of larger scheme in mind of the community and how it's better to live in a peaceful community than one that is at fight all the time. So that's what I mean by community concern. It, re it requires a reflection that goes beyond your own individual interests and goes to the community interests. It's also interesting that it's only older females who do this. Males cannot do this. Uh, if a male moves in here and starts grooming one of these two, given the politics of male chimpanzees, this will immediately be seen as that he's siding with, he's, t he's taking sides. It's a very bad thing to do, and it only makes things worse. Young females are too attractive. If she walks in there and she gets involved, that, that's also not good. So an older female, older post-reproductive females often uh, are the best for this. So that's what the females may do. Now the males, that's an even more difficult task, I would say. They show what is called the control role. They, they are peacemakers in the group. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so upset by our American politicians now being compared to alpha males all the time a term that comes from my book, comes from chimpanzee politics and has been taken and planted into Washington and is now being used all the time, is that for me an alpha male is not a bully. Now, an alpha male is not someone who beats up everybody. That's how it is usually presented in those books on Amazon. You can find them for the business world, how to be an alpha male. Don't take any shit from anybody. So like that's, uh, that's sort of the language they use. But an alpha male, a good alpha male, is a peacemaker in the group and is also the consoler in chief. He's, he's the one who, who provides reassurance to everyone who is upset. And this is a typical alpha male. This is a very good one, actually. A small male. Of, often small males are alpha males. You don't need to be the biggest male to be alpha male. Uh, he's the alpha male, and he's uh, settling a dispute between two females. So these two females uh, have a fight over food, and he stands between them and stops the fight. And the interesting thing of alpha males is that they become impartial. So there's an impartiality, which is not a big issue in morality. Are you impartial or not? They become impartial. They don't side with their best buddies. They may go against their best buddy if that's the aggressor. And so uh, the alpha male has a very specific role. I have a little video clip, I believe, uh, taken at Arnhem. Let's go back. So you will see an alpha male, a young alpha male, actually, Nikki, uh, who is um, settling a dispute. So, so this is a very quick little thing that he does. There's two juveniles fighting, and he steps in and stops it. And it's sort of interesting to me that he does that. Because you, you could argue maybe alpha males do that only because they want to be seen as very important, and they settle important disputes in the group. Uh, there's, a, there's a study by Chris Bohm who did that in Africa in, on wild chimpanzees and, and found the same pattern of control role by males. But even the smallest fights the alpha male will step in. A little fight between two juveniles. And that is because uh, when two kids fight, the mothers are watching, and the mothers may approach and may get... I, I hear that at daycare centers, this is not unusual. The mothers may get into a fight, and then it becomes really serious, and, and it gets out of control. And so by stopping these things at the very beginning, 
Uh, that's a very important task for the males. And the impartiality has been documented. There's now several studies that have documented that, is that the usual preferences of the alpha male, with whom he grooms and with whom he sits and with whom he travels and has sex and the whole thing, the usual preferences are cancelled at this moment. They don't play a role. A good, a good alpha male steps in and protects the underdog, basically. Now, we did one time a study on pigtail macaques, where the males are very big compared to the females, and the males have a very important uh, control role function. They're, they're very efficient at it. And so what we did is we, we removed them, the alpha males. And so this was a study, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but Jessica Flack, we, we had this group of 100 pigtail macaques, and we would take out uh, the three uh, high-ranking males. And, and we would move them into an area separate, and we would keep them there for most of the day, and then at the end of the day, we would release them again. And then two weeks later, we would do the same thing. We did that many times. But we were not intent on disturbing the group, and so that's why we put them back in. And then we would see what happens during the day that these males are out. And what happens is that, uh, we call it a knockout experiment, is that there's more fights in the group. There's an escalation of aggression, so more physical fights, more injuries in the group. There's less reconciliation, so the, the remainder of the group doesn't resolve its conflicts very well. Uh, and there's less grooming and less play behavior, so the group, the group is less affiliative. And basically we concluded that you get a disintegration of the group structure if you take these animals out who perform the control role. So it's a very important role, in some species at least, of course, other species, there's other species that don't need alpha males to do this. So, for example, elephants. The males are not in the group at all. It's just a female group. It's a matriarchal group. But in the primates, this control role business is extremely important to um, keep down the escalation of aggression, basically. So that is the part on conflict resolution. Now, let me say a few things about reciprocal altruism and fairness. Reciprocal altruism. Yesterday I talked about mutualism. Mutualism is the most common type of cooperation where multiple individuals secure benefits at the same time. Reciprocal altruism is much more complex because now I do something for you and maybe two days later you do something for me. And I cannot be sure that you will do that. It depends a bit on your memory. Do you remember that I did something for you? Did you even notice that I did something for you? Uh, and so reciprocal altruism is much more complex than mutualism. Um, it, it requires a time delay between giving and receiving and a contingency between giving and receiving. That's how it is defined. And it, and it was, it's an idea developed by uh, Bob Trivers, who in the 70s wrote a very influential paper, one of the most cited papers in evolutionary biology, about um, reciprocal altruism, where he said, well, if, if A is altruistic to B, meaning that there's a cost for A and a benefit for B, and B is altruistic to A, meaning there's a cost for B and a benefit for A, then you can scratch those costs against each other, and basically you get a B minus C balance for both of them. The example that he gave was not particularly strong, and the example was, uh, if I see you drowning in the river and I jump into the river, I do you a favor. And then later, when a couple of days later, I'm drowning in the river, you jump into the river, you do me a favor. I think it's a very poor example because if you are drowning, means you're probably not so great at swimming. And if I help you, it means that I'm good at swimming. And, and so the reverse is probably not so, so likely. But anyway, he made up examples because there were no examples from the animal kingdom. He, he had to come up with examples. And now we have tons of examples of this kind of behavior. So that's how he developed the idea of reciprocal altruism. And basically, he said, well, that means that you don't need to be kin-related. So kinship was not necessary for this mechanism. Uh, and it can, can function between all sorts of individuals uh, as long as they recognize each other. Uh, they have, need to have a memory of previous events and they need to recognize each other. That's sort of minimum conditions. Now, we have done a lot of experiments on reciprocal altruism. This is, again, the group of chimps that I work with, and uh, I'm going to show you a few videos. Let me, f let me first, before I show this, we, we give them a, a food source that they can share. So it needs to be shareable. 
if you spread food around, you're not going to get food sharing. So we give them, in this case, this is for 20 chimpanzees, we give them five watermelons, and you will see what happens when they come out. So that's food grunts, very happy grunts. There's a very happy male here carrying a whole watermelon. So what is most remarkable about this? There's 20 chimps there and there's five watermelons. What do you think is most remarkable? They don't fight. And why do you think they don't fight? Huh? Hierarchy. No, no, there's, there's, these are not the highest ranking animals who are taking the food. What else? Huh? It's enough, but um, they need to count on sharing. So they don't fight because they know there's going to be a lot of sharing, and in the end, everyone will get something out of it. And so that is, that is sometimes so surprising. What chimpanzees do when you present them with very attractive food is that the, the first thing they do is kiss and embrace each other. And bonobos will have sex together under these circumstances. And then the food comes, and then they share the food very easily. In the wild, when they enter a fruit tree, there's also a lot of kissing and embracing. We call it the celebration. So it's basically a mechanism to avoid the competition. And it's all possible because there is a lot of sharing in society. Here you have the alpha male on the left, who is begging for his food. Even in the 70s, Jane Goodall wrote about that, is that her, her alpha male, Mike, had to beg for his food. So why do you think that is? This is the, ma the alpha male. He can easily take the food. He's dominant over that female who has the watermelon. He can take it. He can beat her up, everything. Why is he not doing this? No one? This is chimpanzee politics. This is the basis of chimpanzee politics. You can only be alpha male with the consent of the majority. You have to have buddies who support you. You have to be popular. If you become an unpopular alpha male because you beat up females to get their food, for example, then by the slightest occasion he is challenged by some other male, everyone turns against him. This is the best occasion to get him and to get rid of him and get somebody else. It's basically... It is a hierarchical system, but there's an element of democracy in there. So, um, th and that's also why I mentioned that alpha males don't need to be the biggest male. And, and it's very common, the smallest male could be alpha male. It depends on who his supporters are and how happy he keeps the supporters. So that's the political system of chimpanzees. Now, then we started doing research on how they share food. This is an absence of sharing here, as you see. Uh, so that happens also. Some individuals are very selfish, some are very generous. Uh, and then the second currency that we use is grooming, which chimps do all the time. And so we, we, we did a study where we did the following. We, in the morning, we measure who grooms whom and for how long. Then we wait a couple of hours. Then we introduce food that they can share. And we measure who shares with whom. And then we have about 7,000 interactions over food, and so you can connect the one with the other. And if you do that, what we find is that um, if A grooms B in the morning, then B is more likely to share food with A in the afternoon. B is not more likely to share with anybody else, so it's not like B is in a good mood and shares with everybody. No, it's specifically with the one who did the grooming. Now, this mechanism requires two things. It requires memory, so you need to remember the previous event, which is really no big deal. Uh, I've known chimpanzees who have remembered my face after 30 years, and so to remember something for two hours is really no big deal. And the second thing is gratitude. That's a virtue, actually, gratitude. <laughs> gratitude, uh, Bob Trivers already mentioned in his work on uh, reciprocal altruism that that's one of the psychological mechanisms that has to be involved is that it's not just that you remember the previous favor that you got, but you're grateful for it and you translate that gratefulness into doing a return favor. 
And so that's the, the mechanism that needs to be involved. And reciprocity is all over the place in chimpanzee societies, not just for grooming and food sharing. There's all these services. They can support each other in fight. They can have sex together. The, there's all sorts of things that they can do for each other. Um, and all these favors are be basically being exchanged. It's one big economy of exchange that is going on. Now, for other species, the evidence is not always as strong. There's a lot of correlational studies. I also did a lot of correlational studies where you, you see who does favors for whom and do they get it back. But this is a sequential study, and that's much stronger evidence. So this is Adam Smith, actually, to return to Adam Smith. He, he, this is about bartering. This is not so bartering is a sort of variation on reciprocity. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. I, s I think it's a great quote, but uh, there's, there's a study on chimpanzees where they found that chimpanzees um, collect papayas to get sex from the females. So this is a male who goes to a papaya tree, and, and the villagers are probably very unhappy with this male doing this. So he's going to their papaya plantation. And then he goes into the tree. And usually the male, several males did this sort of thing. They usually get two papayas. One they eat for themselves. And the other one they bring to a female who's an estrus and trade it for sex. So that's a barter. That, that's what we call barter, where there's a sort of direct exchange. And, and many of the primates are really good at it. And many of our experiments I'll get later to our experiment on fairness, are based on barter, on barter techniques with the monkeys or with the chimpanzees. So let me say a few things about bonobos. Do we do I'm going to go over time probably again today. Uh, bonobos are, of course, what I consider the most empathic apes, and I want to say a few things about them. This is the evolutionary tree as I learned it as a student, it comes out of anthropology. It puts humans like 25 million years separate from the other apes. The other apes are here. And the anthropologists were very happy with this tree until DNA came along. This is the DNA tree. Based on comparing DNA, and according to DNA, we are right in the middle of the apes. We are not really very different from the apes. Uh, and, and according to DNA, a bonobo or a chimp, is more like us than they are like a gorilla. Now, people were very shocked by this conclusion. The chimp is more like us than like a gorilla. And they couldn't accept the conclusion for a long time, but now it is more or less accepted. They had to accept the DNA evidence because it's much more objective than the, the anthro evidence, the anthropologists. They worked on the basis of skulls and bones, and, and there's an enormous amount of judgment and prejudgment that goes in there. And, uh, for example, the anthropologists would say such things as, like, we walk on two legs, and that's very important. But, you know, chickens walk on two legs. I I'm not impressed by walking on two legs. I do it the whole day, but I don't think it's that dramatic. But they, they made that kind of statements, and, uh, and you can make a whole field out of that. This is what bonobos do. Bonobos stand up very easily, have very long legs relative to the other apes have longer legs than the other apes. They look physically very much like Ardipithecus, uh, an ancestral type of us. Ardipithecus had the same brain size, same arm lengths, leg lengths, the same feet even as the bonobo. Basically, Ardipithecus was an upright walking bonobo. And so the bonobo is a very interesting species for uh, discussions about human evolution, because uh, in many ways, and, and recently a paper came out on the musculature of the bonobo being more human-like than that of the chimpanzee. And so the anthropologists try to marginalize the bonobo. They don't like the bonobo. The bonobo is female-dominated, is very sexy, uh, and is very peaceful, doesn't wage war. The groups of bonobos meet and they have sex together, and then they settle down and they have a picnic, and the kids play. And, and, and anthropologists didn't like to see that. They, they like... They like something more aggressive. 
Um, because their whole storyline uh, of human evolution is that we killed, our, uh, killed off everybody and that's why we survive and why we're so successful. So the bonobo doesn't fit. And uh, anthropologists like to marginalize the bonobo, but I think it's a very important species to look at. And they're exactly equally close to us as the chimp. There's no reason to not consider them. Now, the way bonobos resolve conflict is with sex. And I'm going to show you a little video. The easiest way to get sex among bonobos is to give them food. Uh, because, as I already mentioned, they have a celebration. So they have, uh, in their case, an orgy. They have sex to, to resolve the tensions over the food. And so you will see a bunch of bonobos here at the Lola Sanctuary, where we do our research on bonobos, and you will see what happens when the food comes in. So here they're sitting around waiting. These are not wild bonobos. They're in a sanctuary, but they live in a forest. And they're waiting around for their food. And now the food has arrived, and they're having sex at the same time. So they're basically multitasking. They're, they're eating and, and having sex together. And that's how bonobos resolve most of their issues. <laughs> and it's extremely effective. Uh, they have a much more peaceful society than the chimpanzee does. Recently, a paper came out, for example, in Nature about fatal aggression. Fatal aggression in bonobos and chimpanzees in the wild. And it had 152 cases of um, lethal aggression among chimpanzees. It had only one suspected case, was not even observed among bonobos. And so that's the enormous difference that we're facing between the two. It's, they're really radically different, the two species. A reconciliation between bonobos. This happens in a river uh, in which um, some fruit is being thrown, and you will see a little fight, and you will see what happens after the fight. Oh, oh, I need sound. Can you sound on? Oh. <laughs> Turn it down, yeah. Yeah. And that's all it is. I know people think that bonobos have sex eight hours a day, but 10 seconds is long for bonobos. So you have to look at it basically as a, as a genital handshake. That's how I usually put it. So, so, so it is sexual contact, clearly. Sort of funny. We had, at some point, there was a time where, where there were lots of taboos surrounding the bonobo. I, I remember, that, for example, saying that the females are dominant over the males. That was a big taboo on that, and a lot of people call them equidominant. Even though if you ever see a female bonobo chase a male, you know it's not really equidominant what's going on there. So, so that was a taboo, and the sex was a taboo, especially among the American scientists, who are very Puritan. And so um, it's good that the Dutchman opened up the box of the sex in bonobos, um, because they, they kept going around that issue, and they would say, we should call it very affectionate behavior. And I said, well, if I'm in the street in New York and I'm that affectionate with someone, I'm going to get arrested. Is that is, is, you call that affectionate? But they wanted to get around that issue of sex in the bonobos. But bonobos use sex for many different purposes. OK, the last issue I want to treat is fairness. And fairness for me relates to reciprocity. It's very hard to get a reciprocal distribution if there's not some sort of fairness principle involved. And we started doing these studies. That I'm going to first describe the very first study that we did, did with um, Sarah Brosnan on capuchin monkeys, where we discovered by accident that they uh, are very worried about getting less than somebody else. So we did experiments where we would give both monkeys. Uh, these monkeys live in a group, but we take them out into a, a little test chamber. And we can give them both cucumber slices, which is perfectly fine. And, and they will do a lot of work for cucumber. We can give them both grapes. And grapes is far better than cucumber. Grapes have sugar. And sugar is very important for all the primates. And that's why uh, the, the, the food preferences of my monkeys correspond perfectly with the prices in the supermarket. So um, the grapes are much better. And then if we give one of them grapes and the other one cucumber, then you create a difference between the two. And that's, that's what we tested out. And so let me first give you the data. 
if you give both monkeys cucumber, they perform like 100% of the time on, on a very simple task. Both of them get the same food and both of them get cucumber. Now, if you give the partner grapes for the same task, the cucumber one doesn't want to work anymore. Loses interest, performs only 50% of the time. This is something that behavioral economists call irrational behavior. So it's an irrational act. You, you should always take what you can get. If you're a profit maximizer, if I give you one dollar and I give your neighbor one thousand dollars, you may refuse the dollar because you're so pissed off that the other one has gotten one thousand. You may refuse the one dollar, but that's an irrational act. One dollar is better than no dollar. So this is an irrational response. And then if you give the grape to the partner, so the partner now doesn't need to work for the grape anymore, gets it for free, then they really don't want to do it anymore. So effort is part of the picture. Now the same is true for humans. If um, my salary is twice your salary, and we do the same job and have the same experience, that may seem very unfair, at, at least to you it may, to me it may seem okay, but to you it seems unfair. But if I work much harder and I work day and night and you don't, then it's actually fair. So effort is part of the, the picture. This is a video that has now been seen by so many people uh, of the monkey experiment. Um, the one on the left works for the cucumber, the one on the right works for grapes. Gives us a rock, that's the task, gets cucumber. The first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine is eaten, the one on the right gives us a grape, uh, gives us a rock and gets a grape for that. The one on the left looks at that. The one on the left gives us a rock again, gets cucumber again. needs to give us a rock again, gets cucumber again, <laughs> now what is interesting is that when we published this we got a letter from a philosopher it's not someone from this department, but from a philosopher who said it's impossible that monkeys have a sense of fairness because fairness was discovered during the French Revolution. <laughs> now that's what I mean by the top-down view. The top-down view is that we humans, maybe some old guys in Paris, we arrive at some sort of moral principle by thinking and logic and discussions, and then that principle is going to be applied in society. And we all agree that these guys in Paris had a wonderful idea. Fairness seems like a great idea. Let's apply that in society. That's how they look at things. And that's certainly not the way I look at things. I think the principle of fairness comes out of this kind of emotions. That's how, where it got started and that we are able to formulate it and translate it in some sort of moral principle. It's wonderful. That's great. That's all language right there and prefrontal cortex right there. But it starts with much more simple a business of emotional reactions to others. And children have been tested in the same sort of paradigm and have the same sort of reaction. And I usually console the philosophers because I'm a very empathic person. I, I calm them down by saying that in the monkeys, at least at the time, that's what I could say, the one who gets the grape is not worried, and so it is a very egocentric sense of fairness. It's only the one who gets less who is worried about it and reacts emotionally, and the one who gets more is not really worried about it. But then we started testing chimpanzees. And in chimpanzees we found that sometimes the, the chimp who gets the grape will refuse the grape till the other one also gets a grape. Now we're getting very close to the human sense of fairness. And that's why we started to play the ultimatum game with our chimpanzees. So do, do primates strive for equal reward? Th this, is, this is not what the monkeys were doing, but do they do, they do that? And so this is the ultimatum game. 
if you have two players, you, they, you, they divide the money, and you can reject or accept an offer. So it works as follows, the ultimatum game. I give one of you, let's say, $20. You can share that with your neighbor, but your neighbor has to accept. If your neighbor doesn't accept the share, neither of you will get anything. So let's say you give $1 to your neighbor, you keep 19 for yourself. It's very likely that your neighbor will, that's irrational, but your neighbor will not take that. That's why many people end up doing 10 to 10 or 12 to 8. This game has been played all over the world, and all over the world, people, even people who've never heard of the French Revolution, all over the world, people have a sense of fairness. They, they go for the fair distribution. Now, how do you play this game with the primates? That's the question. I cannot give them 20 apples and say you have to share with your neighbor and, uh, and so on. This, this is not going to work. So we had a very different paradigm, and we applied it to children and chimpanzees. So it goes as follows. We have only two distributions that we allow. One is um, the selfish distribution. You get five pieces of banana, and your partner gets one piece of banana. Or an equitable distribution, you get three and your partner gets three. And you need to, f to pick a token for one of the two, and I'll show you how that goes. So basically, you put two chimps side by side. One needs to pick a token, needs to give it to the neighbor. That's where the acceptance part comes in. The neighbor needs to accept it from them and then give it to us. And then we give them the food distribution that goes with this. Let me show you a video of this. So here you have the two tokens, which have different colors, and they have learned what they do, these two tokens do. They have learned that over time. Then we give them a choice between the two. They can take a token and give it to their neighbor. The neighbor needs to give it to us. So here you have a neighbor who accepts the token, gives it to us. We accept the token, and we divide the food accordingly. That's the whole experiment. And we do that, of course, many times and with many different combinations of individuals. Um, so this is the ultimatum game, which had never been successfully played with any animal. And, and, and I'm not sure that um, th there have been attempts made with some sort of apparatus that I don't think the chimps understood. But this is much simpler. This is just with two different, differently colored tokens. Now, if, if you play this one, the, this is called the dictator game. They are completely selfish. They pick the one that gives them the most rewards. The dictator game is as follows. I give you $20, and you can split it with your neighbor, but you can split it any way you want, because your neighbor has no say. Or that's why you call it the dictator game. You're the dictator. You give them something, maybe $1 or $5. Who cares? They have no say in the acceptance. Uh, and so in humans in the dictator game are fairly selfish, not as selfish as this. I think humans are a bit more altruistic in, in the dictator game than the chimps are. But this is a typical outcome for the dictator game. Now, the ultima ultimatum game, in the ultimatum game, the partner has a say. The, the partner needs to accept the token. And this is what you get. It's very similar to the human data. When we did this on children of five to seven years old, we found very similar results. And so we are now at the point that if you ask me, is there a difference in the sense of fairness of humans and chimpanzees? I'm, I'm not sure that there is a difference. I think it's probably very much the same thing. And our thinking on this is, is that it's not irrational. It has to do with cooperation. Is that if you have cooperative relationships, you need to watch what you get. If I go hunting with you every day, let's say, and we hunt together, and you always take the best pieces of meat, and you leave me only a few scraps, I either need to protest, a bit like what the monkey does, I need to start protesting against it, or I need to look for a different partner. I, I, it's not really in my interest to accept this kind of behavior. And so fairness is part of cooperative relationships. That's how we look at it. And so the way Sarah Brosnan and I divided this whole thing is that there's two senses of fairness, two components to it. One is found in monkeys, and but also in dogs and corvids, and many animals are being tested. So, so one is found in, in many animals and in young children. 
and it's a neg negative response to getting less than somebody else. So, so it's resentment and protest. And that is, the, that is the basic principle. Without this, you would not have the sense of fairness. And then the second one, and, and we found that only in adult humans and great apes thus far, is anticipation of disharmony. That you understand that this thing may happen, there may be a negative reaction. If I take everything, you may be pissed off, and I need to prevent that. If I want to maintain a good relationship with you, I need to prevent that from happening. And the way to do that is to equalize the outcome and to make sure that you get some good share also. And so the sense of fairness, I think, is broken down in these two components. And instead of thinking of the sense of fairness as some sort of moral principle that we formulate on the basis of reasoning and logic, I am very much more in favor of saying it's an emotional principle, it's based in the emotions, uh, and there are sort of two levels to it, uh, but it is all related to cooperative relationships, as you would expect for almost any moral principle, that it's related to cooperative relationships. And th that was also Darwin's view. Darwin's view was that morality served cooperation in society. So basically my conclusion is that Darwin was right. Um, I'm, I, I didn't say much about human morality, but uh, it's emotionally driven. Uh, we know that moral dilemmas uh, activate very ancient areas of the brain, not just the prefrontal cortex. Uh, there are many gut judgments going on. Uh, the work of uh, Jonathan Haidt is, is very relevant here, this intuitist type of approach to morality. And in other species, we see reciprocity and fairness, we see empathy and consolation, we see pro-social tendencies. And so many of the things that we value in our moral systems, I'm not saying that a chimpanzee is a moral being the way you are a moral being, but many of these psychological mechanisms that we built into the moral systems can be found outside of our species. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. All the examples you gave of morality in, in uh, you know, all the species you mentioned were uh, examples of within group uh, mm -hmm. interactions. You had one, count, one other example of two groups of bonobos meeting, and that was apparently quite friendly. What's known about uh, morality between groups? Yeah, that's a real challenge. So I think, and, and actually Darwin said the same thing, Morality evolved as an in-group phenomenon. It doesn't make much sense to, if you have enemies living next doors, to be highly moral about them. And so, uh, it is an in-group phenomenon used initially within the species, within your own group. Uh, moral treatment of other species also don't think was very important in the beginning of the evolution. But, and that's, and that's where the top-down approaches actually come in. But you can formulate moral principles within the group and start to try to apply them outside of the group. So, for example, let's say f fairness, which I just treated. You, you can have a beautiful fairness system within your group, but you could also say, well, if I need to be fair to the members of my group, why shouldn't I be fair to the members of some other group? So if you look at, for example, universal human rights, or the Geneva Convention, for example. The Geneva Convention is not a principle that chimpanzees would come up with, I think. That's a very human thing, is to try to extrapolate from your in-group phenomena to out-group phenomena, and uh, to say, well, I need to respect my enemies. My enemies deserve respect just like uh, somebody else. That, that's a new way of thinking. I don't think that's, that comes straight out of biology. That comes out of a different way of thinking that is human-like. And I've never seen in animals evidence that they would apply these principles that operate in their own society to, uh, certainly not to competing groups, maybe to, maybe to friendly groups that they live with, but not to competing groups. Um, yeah, you have a microphone there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I know that humans and like many other species like you were talking about have this 
innate sense of morality and fairness, but humans tend to manifest that or try to manifest that into religion. Um, are there any other animals that kind of seem to, that we've observed that seem to have a sense of like some kind of religion or spirituality? That has recently been debated. I don't know if you know, uh, uh, most of you probably don't know. There was a discovery made in, um, in Africa in the forest that chimpanzees would occasionally go to hollow trees and gather stones and throw them in there. And so they would pile up stones, they would be very agitated, they would have their hair up, they would, mostly males who did it, and they would pile stones up. And, and once they had noticed this once or twice, they set up cameras all over the forests in Africa, and they noticed it was not limited to one group, there were m many groups of chimps who did this thing. It was described in the literature as a ritual. It, it, was, it is clearly a ritual. I, I don't have any problem with talking about rituals in animals. As many animals have courtship rituals and so on. The rituals are very common. But it was described as a ritual. Uh, but then one of the scientists uh, in an unguarded moment in an interview said it was maybe a sacred ritual. So when it became a sacred ritual, it, it all escalated very quickly. And uh, a week later, the Daily Mail had a headline, Chimpanzees Believe in God, <laughs> which was a bit of a jump coming from piling stones up in, in a hollow tree. Um, but that's where we were. Uh, we still don't know why they do this, and we don't know. It, it could be that it's a male display behavior and that others are watching. We don't even know if others are watching when this happens. Um, but it, it fits a bit with that idea that also some have promoted, is that uh, chimpanzees can be very impressed by natural phenomena, like a waterfall or a rainfall. I myself have seen chimpanzees doing a rain dance. Uh, so if, if all of a sudden there's a, there's a heavy downpour with thunder and so, the, the males will put up their hair and start walking around. And uh, this sort of rain dance that they do. But still, that doesn't amount to religion to me. It amounts to being impressed by certain natural phenomena, which is maybe related, uh, but we don't have evidence that they have a belief in supernatural forces, for example. Um, and, and so I'm very reluctant to get into the religion business with the primates. I, I'm not sure that we are ready for that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have a question which is actually related to the question to the question we heard before. Um, how does it work with um, fairness or like morals and especially empathy between species? Do you came across an example where we found an example of one species um, being empathetic to another to another um, individual of another species with maybe completely different needs? That's certainly a possibility. For example, in captivity, um, we had one time a, a bonobo who uh, rescued a bird. And the bird had flown against the window of, of the enclosure and, and was stunned. And the bonobo picked up the, bono the bird and took it to the highest point of the enclosure, which was a tree, and sat in the tree and unfolded the wings and tried to send it out like this. It, w it was not necessarily good for the bird, but it was the right idea. It was the idea, this is what a bird needs. So that, that it takes some of this imagination. Support between members of different species occurs also. There's, for example, recently a report that was that humpback whales support seals against killer whales. So that's between different species. The, the, the seals are attacked by the killer whales and the humpback whales chase off the killer whales. I, I'm, I've never been sure that that was an empathy issue because I think also the humpback whales, they hate the killer whales so much that they may look at this as a good occasion to get them. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how much empathy was involved here. But in principle, I look at empathy as something that evolved for the in-group, involved between close relationships, uh, mother offspring and other close relationships, friendships and so on, cooperative relationships. But once that mechanism exists, and we humans do that all the time. Once that exists, it can be applied outside of your group and outside of your species. And so if humans, for example, find a stranded whale and try to push it back into the ocean, that's an act of empathy that we apply to 
a different species. And, and that requires that you're not in great need, because of course if these humans are starving they, and a whale strands, they will do something totally different with the whale than pushing it back into the ocean. So, so it is uh, predicated on, on our wealth and possibilities, but we do that kind of things. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I have two short questions. First of all, you mentioned that eye contact is very important for human uh, cancellation and it's not so important for animals. So could you mention some name or some study that uh, uh, can prove this point of view? And the second thing, uh, do you know something why it's not important for animal? Well, I was saying the apes use eye contact. So, um it's humans and apes that you that are dependent, I think, very much on eye contact, and they um, they look each other in the eyes very often. Uh, whereas, for example, monkeys, let's say baboons, if you look those in the eyes, they see that as a threat because that's also how they threaten each other by staring at each other. And so, if you want to be friendly with a baboon. Um, you shouldn't, uh, and with a dog for that matter, you shouldn't necessarily look straight into the eyes. That's not always a friendly gesture to them. I'm not sure that there is systematic evidence on this. There are studies on eye contact between humans, obviously, and, and the width of pupils. There's, there's a lot of studies on pupil size and so on. But I'm not sure that there are comparative studies on how, let's say, chimpanzees make eye contact or avoid eye contact. I'm not sure that these systematic studies exist. This is more like an impression that I have, and, and I, I do know that in bonobos and chimps it's very unusual to see a reconciliation without eye contact. And in monkeys it's very common. What do you think about the argument by people like Sarah Blahardy that we are the only species among the great apes that adopted cooperative breeding <laughs> something like one million years ago? And if, and if that's so, we are the most sympathetic great ape species long before the French Revolution. <laughs> well, I'm not sure she relates that to uh, empathy directly. So I, I know the ideas of Sarah Hardy pretty well. Uh, and so, yeah, cooperative breeding occurs in, uh, in birds and occurs in primates, but not in the great apes necessarily. So there's a few primates who do this. Um, but in the great apes, no, they're, they're pretty pretty much loners. And for example, um, a, a female bonobo or a female chimpanzee, that's why the interbirth interval is so extremely long between the, for them, is, is that they're completely on their own. So a female bonobo, she has a baby on her belly, and then when it gets older, she puts it on her back, uh, and maybe six years later, she has her next baby, and, and that one of that is six year old may still on occasion be on her back. And so it's very hard if you are an arboreal primate, you travel through the canopy, it's very hard if you travel through the trees to have two kids clinging to you. And so uh, that's why the interbirth interval is so long. And in humans, the big innovation of human society, I know people always think it's morality and culture and religion and all those wonderful things. It's the involvement of fathers and families. That's the big innovation. That's made a huge difference. Uh, much bigger than all these other things, in my opinion. And so fathers are involved in the families, and that allows us to have kids every two years, which is wonderful. We're now seven billion people in the world. This is what we really need, have kids every two years. But it allowed us to expand fast like that, which, which the apes were unable to do. And so the involved of, of fathers, and of course, according to Sarah Hart, Hardy, it goes much further than that. It's not just the fathers. It's the whole community being involved in child rearing, which I think is the case. And if you think of it, when we traveled out of the forest into the savanna, something needed to happen because the savanna is a very dangerous place. And I, and I know that often our early time is sort of depicted, it used to be depicted by Raymond Dart and people like that, is that we were the predators of the savanna. No, we were the prey of the savanna. We, we did not dominate the savanna. The hyenas were bigger than now. The, the lions were bigger than now. We were smaller than now. We were maybe this tall. We were prey items. And so something needed to happen. In, instead of having females taking care of the offspring and the males being sort of oblivious and, 
uh, and, and not being involved and all the males needed to get involved, I think, when that kind of society was formed. And so it became a much more cohesive society uh, and, and much more involved in childcare all around. And so yeah, I believe there's, there's a lot of value to those ideas, um, much more than many of the competing ideas that I know. How about humans and hierarchy? Uh, is it always there? And uh, could groups function without hierarchy? Yeah, hierarchy is, I think, the, the potential of hierarchy is always there. So humans are a very hierarchical species. I know that many people want to be, especially in academia, they want to be egalitarian. Um, but uh, even in academia, there's all sorts of power struggles going on. And um, I've noticed so myself. And <laughs> I think humans are a very hierarchical species. But we have sometimes the ideal that we want to be egalitarian. Now, egalitarianism takes an effort. So there is an interesting work by Christoph Baum, who is an anthropologist who used to work on chimpanzees and works on humans. And um, he says that um, egalitarianism requires leveling mechanisms, as he calls it. So there are many human societies that are egalitarian, small-scale, nomadic, hunter-gatherer societies, because as soon as you go to agricultural societies, it disappears and they become very hierarchical. So, but he thinks that the original condition may be egalitarianism, and it's actively maintained. So he has documented how it is maintained. It is basically done by, as soon as you, let's say, you live in a small community, and a, a man tries to start to dominate, it's always a man, of course, a man start, tries to start to dominate the thing, uh, and tries to have more than one wife, or more than one garden, and more and more possessions. Um, the others turn against him and they start at first making jokes about him behind his back and gossiping about him. Then they start making jokes about him in his presence and it may end very badly by them expelling him or even killing him and he has documented all these cases. And so he calls that leveling mechanisms. Humans have very strong leveling mechanisms which are basically coalitions from below. So it's, it's uh, as soon as someone tries to reach the top and uh, to start to dominate, there's a coalition from below that tries to drag him down and make things egalitarian. And, and so it is an actively maintained system, which means that, um, that there is a very strong hierarchical tendency in humans because it needs to be countered actively. We need to do something about it, otherwise you get a hierarchy. And when we became agriculturalists, everything changed and hierarchies came back and, and uh, very strongly developed in the human species. So hum humans have this very interesting balance between wanting to be egalitarian and sometimes being capable of being that way, but also having very strong hierarchical tendencies and uh, very quickly you get displays of rank. And if, if you walk into a boardroom of a corporation Usually within 10 seconds, you can tell approximately what the hierarchy is of people. You can see that right away because we are very in tune with hierarchies and we detect it immediately. There are studies of looking at faces of leaders or non-leaders uh, in pictures and we can, within, within a, a fraction of a second, we see if someone is a dominant character or not a dominant character. So we're very quick at detecting these things and that means it has been very important in, in our uh, history. And I think hierarchies remain operational and they remain extremely influential and we look up at our leaders. And, and yes, the enforcement of moral principles is very of, often up to the leaders. Uh, very often uh, we look for, for them to tell us what to do and what not to do in life. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, well, as you just mentioned, human morality is subject to history and morality can change between societies among humans. Uh, have you noticed whether social norms can vary within the same species among non-humans? And have you tried, that is you biologists, um, to induce new social norms in an animal group and see whether they reproduce that norm? Yeah. I don't think we have tried the last thing. 
So yes, um, human morality changes over time and changes from place to place, which already indicates that there is no sort of biological paradigm for morality. I think the influence of biology on morality is in a sort of very indirect way through the um, psychology and the psychology, what I call the, the moral building blocks, so, so to speak. But the specific rules, if you see the discussion about let's say homosexuals or abortion uh, or whatever moral principle you or the death penalty. Um, the reason we have these discussions is because these things are not etched in stone biologically clearly. So, so yes, that's, that is evidence for the flexibility of the system. In other primates, we, I don't think we have strong evidence like this, but, but I do remember a very different group. So for example, I've known rhesus monkey groups that are were extremely hierarchical, and then I have other groups where um, they're actually quite tolerant of each other, where, for example, the alpha male will allow low-ranking males to have sex with females within his view, and in other groups um, they have to disappear from his view and hide in order to have sex with females. And so um, uh, the people have noted that also in groups of chimpanzees, that some chimpanzee groups are very relaxed and easygoing and other chimpanzee groups are not. And so we probably do have that kind of variability going on, but no one has tried to change the rules, if that's what you mean. And I don't know how we would actually do that. I don't know how we would set up a system. Uh, and even in humans, I'm not sure you could do that. If you would, if you would tell, for example, the Swedes all, all of a sudden become very nasty to each other, um, and because that's your rule, I'm not sure how successful you would be with that. So, so that it's going to be hard, I think, to change the kind of ingrained rules in the system. Uh, Christoph Bohm. Christoph, Christoph Bohm is B O E H M. He wrote a book, um, Hierarchies in the Forest. And I think it's about chimpanzees and humans. Yeah. Um, could it be that bonobos sometimes fight in order to uh, reconcile by sex? <laughs> <laughs> You're very smart, yeah. <laughs> it's a possibility. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a possibility that they create tensions in order to have sex with others. But sex is so easy and easygoing in a bonobo society. It's not like it's hard to get, you know? So um, I don't think they need to work that hard on it. Yeah. Uh, maybe they just want to get in the mood. Yeah. 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 Maybe they have an aggressive mood in sexuality, I mean. Huh? You mean that they mix the two moods? Yeah, I'm not sure that, that that's what they do. No. We have one question up here. Hey. While backpacking in West Africa, we came a group of monkeys once. We had a bag full of peanuts that were sugar-coated, and the other one were just groundnuts in shells. So to feed the monkeys, we started giving them the normal groundnuts that were in shells. But then they, one of them tried the sugar-coated ones. And then uh, out of the blue, one of them snatched the bag and ran up the tree. So I wanted to know, since we're talking about morality, what made it think that it was OK to snatch the bag and run away? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that monkey was thinking of your interests at that point. Uh, yeah, so. Um, these were baboons or something? Yeah, uh, yeah, the baboons are a big problem in South Africa. Is that where you're from? Okay, yeah, but, uh, but uh, baboons do that kind of stuff all the time with the tourists. Let me tell you one, one last uh, story on this kind of stuff. Is this, uh, um, I was at a field site with chimpanzees in Tanzania. And um, they had promised me, because we were eating only rice and beans every day, they had promised me they would um, get a duck and, and make a real meal for one time. And um, the cook of the, of, of the camp, which was a little fellow like this, he had gone all the way up the lake in a little boat and he came back with a duck and he had carried the live duck uh, out of the boat towards the camp, which was a long distance. And um, 
He said he was confronted by a female chimp who came up to him and wanted to duck from him. And uh, he, he, he made a very heroic tale out of it, how he had fought with the female. I don't think he did. He didn't have any scratches on it, but he, he made a heroic tale. And he had brought the duck to camp. And I still remember Nishida, a very important field primatologist, telling me that this has happened before. And if it was a male, because this happened with males, there would be no duck. And the male would have stolen the whole thing. So the, the chimps recognize immediately this is an edible item. Uh, and um, in this case, they, uh, they have no compulsion uh, stealing a duck from us. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>